You may be seated. Amen. Good morning. Good to see everyone. You know this, this whole story of redemption. If you imagine it as a giant mountain, the very peak of it, it begins with, for God so loved the world, and it all flows down from there. Thank you, Mark, for leading us in that song. Glad to see you this morning. Glad you're here. And for those that are watching online and on TV, we're glad to have you this morning. And if you're watching later in the week, just join in with us like you were there real. But when, when I want to think about this thing. I want you to come in and sit down with us and worship our Savior together and learn of his word and his will for our lives. Amen. I want to remind you of some things uh, coming up. Next Sunday, we're going to be united in worship at 11 a.m., all of us together. No 8.30 service at 11 a.m. encourage you to be there. Sunday school is still at 9.45. And then at 5 o'clock, we're going to all meet at Harold Park uh, for just a, a wonderful time of fellowship and family and food and friends. Do you, are some of you old enough to remember the uh, Yogi Bear cartoons? <laughs> and Yogi was always trying to steal the picnic basket, right? So bring you a picnic basket with food for your family and we'll enjoy the family time fellowship and some fireworks afterward when, the, uh, when it gets dark enough. So there'll be inflatables for the kids. The gates open at five o'clock. So looking forward to that. But we're glad you're here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. This is the day that we gather together to worship you, to honor you, to thank you for you so loved us that you sent your only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have eternal life. So, we, Lord, we praise you this morning. Help us to worship you. I pray for Brother Dean as he comes in a few minutes. You just fill him with your spirit to proclaim your truth. Lord, I pray that you just help us to Hear that word from you this morning. We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, church. Stand and help us sing again this morning. Sing it out. Who can satisfy? Trust in you, my God. 
Say amen this morning, church. Amen. Sing this with me. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the ways you have tried. Sing it out. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith. You may be seated. But nothing I desire 
You're already all I need, already everything that I could hope for. You're already all I need, and you've already set me free. When Jesus is all we have left, then we'll know that he's all we ever needed. Thank you so much, Julie, for blessing our hearts. And uh, Julie, Eddie, we're so glad that you guys are home. They're having to split their time now between here and another work obligation out of state. We're so delighted that they are able to be with us today. And Julie, thanks again for blessing our hearts of course, Julie's parents are none other than Steve and Carolyn. And uh, Steve, Carolyn, thank you all. We, we love you all. We're so honored that you're a part of our fellowship. And, and thank you again for blessing us. And thank you, choir, for singing this morning about the faithfulness of God. Our God is faithful, even in the midst of the most difficult times of life. Is there any word from the Lord today? Well, I believe there is. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Kings in the Old Testament, chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. In case you did not bring a copy of God's Word with you, you'll find on the, in the Pew Bible in front of you this text in, on pages 323 and 324. While you're turning to 1 Kings, chapter 19, beginning with verse 1, let me just say with a grateful heart that this past week, church, we saw a 50-year-old prayer answered when Roe versus Wade was overturned. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We have been supporting our pregnancy crisis ministry. We have been doing all we can to foster adoption and to help people to make the, the choice, the decision of life. And that's where we stand. That's where we stand as a church. That's where we stand as believers because we stand on the Word of God. And so we make no apology for that, but we've got to give God all the glory because He was faithful and answered a great and mighty prayer. Is there any word from the Lord when we come to what seems to be the end of the road? How do we move forward when our flesh is screaming at us and telling us to give up, to quit, and there's no hope? I believe that there is a great word from the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 19. I want us to talk about it this morning because I believe it's going to speak to someone here and someone beyond this extended audience that's watching with us today. 1 Kings chapter 19 comes on the heels of the prophet Elijah witnessing a miraculous response of the God of Israel over the false god, we say Baal, but in Hebrew Baal. Fire from heaven came down in 1 Kings chapter 18. It came down on top of Mount Carmel, meaning the vineyard of God, consumed the altar of Baal. I've been on Mount Carmel dozens of times, and every time I walk on top of that mountain, I think about this story from 1 Kings 18 where the fire fell on that pagan altar of Baal. The people cried out as they saw the fire fall from the God of heaven. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The false prophets of Baal were slain with the sword. 
At this point, Elijah should have been filled with courage and enthusiasm. Instead, by the time we get to chapter 19, he is filled with hopelessness and despair. Here's what I've discovered, church. Some of the greatest tests that you and I will ever go through will happen just after great victories. So if you've experienced a great victory in your life, just be aware that the enemy is coming full force. And I think that that is true with what's happened this past week in our nation. The enemy is not going to lie down. The enemy is not going to go asleep or go away. He is going to come back with full force, and we had better be alert and aware of what he's going to do. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab, the king of Israel, told Jezebel, his wonderful wife, all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Now let's stop right there for a moment, church. Who were Ahab and Jezebel? Ahab was the seventh king of the northern kingdom of Israel. He married a godless woman by the name of Jezebel. She was the daughter of Ithbaal, the king of the Sidonians. She influenced Ahab even to build a pagan worship center to Baal, to Baal in the capital city of Samaria. The Bible says this, look at the screen. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him, 1 Kings 16, 33. Jezebel was not only Ahab's partner in idolatry, she was the ringleader, she was the mastermind of everything in society that day that was anti-God. One of the first things that she did was to kill many of the prophets of the Lord. Why? If the prophet's not saying what you want to hear, if the prophet's not preaching what you want to hear, get rid of the prophet. So what did she do? She had them executed. She was wicked, she was pagan, and she was ruthless. Look at verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods, little g, do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, one of the prophets that you slain by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, Elijah rose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. I, I want to speak a word to somebody here today, somebody beyond this extended audience who is dealing with the sense, the feeling of hopelessness. The message today is a word to those who are hopeless. And may the Lord bless the reading of His Word. Jesus called Satan a thief. A thief who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Satan will so often use people and circumstances our emotions, other situations in our lives to try to defeat us, detour us, and to destroy us and convince us that there is no hope in going forward in our lives. Some of you that are here today, I do not know who is so discouraged right now. Boy, do you ever need to hear these words today because you are so discouraged you're watching by way of television or listening later to this message and you are so discouraged, so beat down, you feel like your situation, your life is hopeless. God has a word for you today. Now, what caused Elijah to be so discouraged that he literally wanted to end his life? What caused this man of God to feel so hopeless. I believe that Elijah was dealing with three demons. I want you to get this in your notes. These are real enemies that can come against us as well. First of all, he was dealing with the demon of intimidation. Jezebel was an intimidator. Again, she threatened to kill Elijah. If you look back at verse 2 of what we just read, she sent a message to him. These, this was before the days of email. 
She sent a message to him, probably by a messenger, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take you out. Just as you killed my prophets, the prophets of Baal, so am I going to take your life. Listen, have you ever gotten an intimidating email before? You ever gotten an intimidating letter before? Have you ever been in a confrontation with an intimidator? Somebody who just confronts you. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe you've gotten that vile phone call before from somebody who has threatened you. They are an intimidator. Webster defines intimidator as one who causes fear or a sense of inferiority. Now listen, that they might dominate, control, and coerce another. And it happens every day. It happens at home. It happens at work. It happens at school. It happens in the church, unfortunately. An intimidator is a bully. A bully that wants to threaten you and intimidate you. That's what Satan is, by the way. He's an intimidator. He is the enemy who tries to intimidate God's people. Oh, don't speak up. Don't say anything. You might be badly thought of. Well, I think it's time that we just go ahead and speak up, church, and quit, quit worrying about the intimidator. Satan is an intimidator. So the first demon that Elijah was dealing with was the demon of intimidation. Look at the second demon, the demon of imagination. I want you to see this in verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. Did you notice that? It does, it does not say that when he heard that. It says when he saw that. What was going on? He began to think the worst case scenario. He got this message and he saw in his mind, this is going to be my humiliation. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be executed. I'm going to be mocked. He saw it in his mind. By the way, Mark Twain, remember what he said? He said, most of what we worry about never happens. We allow the devil to defeat us because we take our focus off of the Lord Jesus and we put our focus on the worst case scenario and we begin to believe the lies of the devil instead of believing the promises of God. And so Elijah was dealing with not only an intimidator, he was dealing with his own imagination, the demons of imagination that were telling him, you are going to die, you are going to suffer, you are going to be humiliated. But look at one more demon that he was faced with, church. I call it the demon of isolation. Three times, Elijah feels like he is all alone. Listen, some of you can testify to this. It's, it's in the alone times when we got a lot of time to think that sometimes in that isolation, the devil will have his victory in our mind and our heart. That's the battleground. The battleground is our mind, our heart. And when we feel like we're all alone, Look at it three times, verse 4. But he himself, literally the Hebrew reads, by himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Verse 10, I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Verse 14, the very same thing. I'm alone. I'm all by myself. Isolation is a powerful weapon that Satan uses to defeat us. Listen to me. We need one another. And we need the Lord. If, if Satan's got you in a situation, well, I don't need the church. I, I don't need those people down there at First Baptist. I can go solo. I can do this thing all by myself. He's so happy when you drop out of church. You do need us. And we need you. Because we need the encouragement that others can afford. Has anybody else had this experience? You can get discouraged, but then all of a sudden you come to church and you're around God's people and around God's Word and you hear the choir sing and you, you're suddenly just filled with encouragement. Suddenly what seemed 
that you were battling with. It doesn't seem as bad anymore. It doesn't seem as difficult anymore because you've been encouraged. Oh, listen, the demons of isolation will pull you down. So don't think you can do this thing and gain the victory all on your own. Elijah was in the depths of despair and hopelessness because of the demons of intimidation, imagination, and isolation. But God had not given up on Elijah. God had not deserted him, and God has not deserted you either. Look what Elijah did. He took off, like some of us do. When we feel it's hopeless, what do we do? We run, and we run from God. Verse 3 says, He arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah in southern Israel. Beersheba, by the way, is a a two-and-a-half-hour drive from Mount Carmel to Beersheba by car on Route 6 in Israel. But it's a 38-hour run if you're going to run or walk to Beersheba from Mount Carmel. Let's talk a little bit about Beersheba for just a moment. I want you just to know a little Bible study about this, a couple of things By the way, Beersheba is not a tavern in Bull's Gap. Just mark that down somewhere on your notes this morning. Beersheba is actually the Roman pronunciation of the city. In Hebrew, it is Beersheba. Be'er meaning well, Sheva, the number seven. Abraham made a treaty with the local king there. Isaac dug a well there. They were the ones that named this place Beersheba, the well of seven or the well of of the oath. It was the southernmost point of habitation in the land of Israel. It's where, have you heard this phrase in the Bible, from Dan to Beersheba? From north, Dan is all the way to the north, from north to south. That's what that means. From Dan to Beersheba. And here is Elijah running almost all the way from the north not quite all the way to the north, but all the way from the north to the south. But he didn't stop there. He didn't stop at this last outpost of civilization. Look what the Bible says at the end of verse 3. Elijah left his servant there in Beersheba, but he himself, again, literally the Hebrew, by himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, into the heart of the Negev desert. Now, folks, how do we know that Elijah was so hopeless that he was ready to die? Because he ran into the desert without any companions or without any provision. It was absolute suicide. Jonah fled to the sea. Here is Elijah fleeing to the desert. Both were running away from their call from God. Look at the last part of verse 4. And he came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, It's enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. I want you to get the sense of what's going on here. Elijah was emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausted. And some of you may feel the same way today. I just don't know how much more I can take. I just don't know if I can go any further. And even though Elijah had given up on himself, oh, get this church, God had not given up on him. Because look what God did for him. God provided four things for him. Get this again in your notes, verses 5 through 8. Number one, God provided a broom tree for him. A scruffy little desert shrub. You say, well, that's not much. Why didn't God provide a big oak tree for him? God knew just exactly what he needed. A little shade in the daytime and a little protection from the cold wind of the desert at night. So God provided a broom tree for his servant, Elijah. He also provided something else. He provided an angel. Verse 5 says, suddenly an angel touched him. He sent one of his divine messengers to encourage his servant. I don't know about you, but I believe in angels. And I also believe that God not only sends angels, but he also will use his people as encouragers in our lives. 
I cannot tell you, church, how many times you have been an encouragement to me. When there are times that I'm discouraged and some of you will send me a card or a Sunday school class will send me a card or somebody will send me an email or somebody will come by and say, Pastor, we're praying for you. I'm telling you, God uses angels, but he also uses his people as angels as well. We've got to be, listen to me, we've got to be a family of believers who encourage one another because there is so much hopelessness and so much despair and so much sickness in our world today. Look at the third thing that God provided for his servant, physical nourishment. God said to him, or the angel said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked and there by his head was a, a cake baked on the coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Does God care about us not only spiritually but also physically? No one ever cared for me like Jesus. He cares what you're going through. He cares about you physically. He cares about you spiritually. He cares about you emotionally. He is there to encourage you. Look at a fourth thing that God provided for His servant in verse 8, supernatural strength. The Bible says that Elijah arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. That's some powerful soul food right there. Psalm 46, 1 says that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. God gave Elijah, his servant, his comfort, his encouragement, food to eat, as well as strength for his future journey. All of this was divine provision. Our God stands ready to meet your every need. He cares about you. Paul said in Philippians 4, 19, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I don't want you to miss this, church. Where did Elijah run to? Look at the last part of verse 8. As far as Horeb the mountain of God. Do you know what Horeb is? It's Mount Sinai. <laughs> Folks, it's the place where God spoke to Moses in the burning bush to tell him, I want you to be the deliverer of my people from Egypt. It's the place where God led the children of Israel back to, to enter into a covenant relationship with them. It's the place where God gave Moses the commandments. It's the place, listen, where God had spoken before. Elijah, instead of running away from God, why don't you run to where God speaks? What is that saying for us? Instead of running away from God, instead of going back to the old life and the old world and going out and drinking or filling your veins filled with drugs, why don't you go back to the place where God has already spoken? Why don't you go back to His Word? That's where we need to run to. Not run away from God or, or His will. We need to run to the place where God speaks. Oh, Word of God, speak to us. Speak to our hearts that we may hear Your voice and hear Your direction and Your encouragement in our lives. And look at verse 9, because no matter where Elijah went, God was still there. <laughs> And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah then lays all of his cards out on the table. He is totally honest with God. Hey, no need to be spiritual. You're around God. He knows everything you're thinking. He knows all your thoughts. You might as well just lay it out there and tell him how you feel. And so Elijah told God exactly what was on his heart. So he said, verse 10, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. 
Folks, is it okay to tell God how you feel? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's okay to say to God, Lord, I just, I'm having a hard time in my weak mind and heart. I'm having a hard time understanding this mess that I'm walking through right now. Look what God told him to do. Look at verses 11 and 12. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Isn't that interesting? And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. By the way, what an awesome display of power that Elijah just witnessed. If there was anything that this prophet was familiar with, he was familiar with storms and earthquakes and fire. He had seen it all his life. But don't miss this. Get this in your spirit today. Storms, earthquakes, fires, disasters... That's the way God speaks to those who do not know Him. The fire fell on Mount Carmel for the pagans there who were worshiping Baal to realize that that El Shaddai was the true God. The the rains that came after a a three-and-a-half-year drought were there for the pagans to see that God, not Baal, is the God of the ages and God of the weather. It's those kinds of things that God uses to get the attention of the pagans, the lost, to help them to understand His mightiness and His power. But how does God speak to us? I want you to get this in your notes today through a still small voice. Listen to me to believe her, that that voice that speaks to your heart when you're discouraged, that speaks from within you, that is not just your conscience. That is the living Holy Spirit speaking to you, encouraging you, helping you, giving you strength. Romans 8, 26, Paul says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It's it's that still, small voice that speaks to my heart when I'm in the hospital room or when I'm at the funeral home trying to make arrangements, or in the courtroom, or at my job when I don't think I can go any further. It's the the still small voice of the Holy Spirit that's in my empty home when my kids or my spouse is gone. Or when I'm overwhelmed by loneliness or when I feel so empty and dry on the inside, when I'm hurting, when no one else seems to care or understand, it's the still small voice of the Spirit of the living God that has come to live in my life that is speaking to me, encouraging me, telling me, yes, you can go on. I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you. And one more thing, church. God was not finished with Elijah. Look at verse 13. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle. Some people believe that his mantle was his prayer shawl in Hebrew called the talit. And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. A second time, God speaks to him and asks Elijah the same question. Verse 13, suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here when I want you somewhere else? What are you doing here when I want you over there? And Elijah again repeats his storyline. <laughs> Lord, I'm all you got left. I, I'm all you got left, there, and they're trying to take me out. Do you understand how desperate this situation is? I'm the only prophet left, and God basically says, Elijah, it's time for the pity party to end. You're not finished. 
and I still have a purpose for your life. As a matter of fact, look at verse 15 and 16. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, back up to the north, and then to the east of Israel. And when you arrive, I want you to do three things. Anoint Hazael over the, as king over Syria, Assyria. Anoint Yehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat. Shaphat in Hebrew means judge. And Elisha, the son of the judge, Shaphat, of Avel Meholah. Avel Meholah, by the way, some of you have been to Israel with us and we've gone to Beit Shean. It's just below Beit Shean on this side, the western side of the Jordan River. It literally means the stream of the dance. I want you to go back. And I want you to anoint Elisha as the prophet who will take your place. Do you see this, church? God still had a purpose and a plan for Elijah. And God has a purpose and a plan for your life until the day he decides to take you and I home. We've got to understand that. He stands by, he stands ready to give us his provision, his presence, and his purpose. But we've got to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, not leaning to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging Him, and He will direct our paths, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Now one more word that God had for him. Elijah, you think you're alone? Son, you are not alone. <laughs> Look at verse 18. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. I still have some prophets. I still have some men of God who refuse to bow before Baal. I don't know about other preachers, and we got a lot of preachers that watch this series and this sermon and these messages. I don't know about all of you guys, but I want to be a part of the 7,000. I don't ever want to bow before Baal and be counted among his crowd. Satan's goal is to discourage you. His goal is to defeat you. His goal is to detour you. His goal is to destroy you. Listen, I'm talking to somebody here today. He wants you to quit. He wants you to throw in the towel. He wants you to quit church. He wants you to quit your marriage. He wants you to quit living for Jesus. He wants you to stop serving Jesus. But God wants you to go the distance. Your life is not hopeless. Do you hear me today? Because the presence of God is living in you. I, I, I want you to hear the words of this song. Listen to it. When hearts start to break and emotions run wild, when it's all you can do just to paint on a smile, when tears start to flow down the lines on your face, you may feel there's no mercy, but don't give up on grace. Now listen to this. There's hope for the hopeless. There's no need to fear. When all seems lost, my friend, Jesus is near. And He's right there with you, whatever you are faced with today. Here's the word of the Lord today. Get it. Here's God's word for somebody here today. God wants to give you His strength as you journey forward. And that's my prayer for you.